I think it's a beautiful thing. We are a church that believes in diversity. We are a beautiful reflection of God's church. And we're going to hear a little bit more about that today. Um, I invite you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3 if you would like to. Children, you are free to go downstairs to Children's Church and uh, have a great time down there. Thank you to our worship team. What a beautiful morning of worship this morning. Amen. Amen. That last song, boy, doesn't that just kind of make you want to like jump out of your seats a little bit? Like, boy, that was beautiful. Thank you. What a beautiful, beautiful picture this morning. I think you'll see how those songs of worship tie together uh, with the scriptures that we are reading today. We are in Ephesians chapter 3. And as you know, we are in a series called Masterpiece in Progress. And uh, our series is looking uh, at uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians and how that uh, letter was meant to encourage some people who were kind of new to the faith, new to church, and new to all of uh, kind of what this whole thing of, of following Christ was all about. And so Paul was writing this letter to be an encouragement and um, I think one of the, the most difficult things for us to do is when we break it down like we have over the first few weeks, right? We've, we've taken little bite-sized chunks. And when you take it in the chunks that we have, like the verses maybe we broke up into chapter one and we broke chapter two into two parts and now we're into chapter three, you don't get the sense over the course of a month that we are kind of coming to a climax in the letter. You, you sort of have to read the whole letter together to get the sense that we are coming to a climax in this letter. Chapter 3 rep represents a climax of sorts in the letter. And then after this, we're going to get into so the, the so what. But up until now, chapters 1 through 3, it's kind of been like, this is who you are. I want you to know who you are and what Christ has done for you. And chapter 3 is the culmination of that declaration and so we're going to see that this morning and it starts out with that kind of perspective and when the verses say um for this reason is how you heard it right for this reason it's it's meant to call your attention to everything that he's spoken up to that point one of the translations says when i think of all of this when i think of all of this You'll note, if you will, just briefly, that if you jump your eyes down to verse 14, if you're following along, it basically says the same exact thing. And he says this, when I think of all of this, it's kind of like verses 2 through 13 are just this little parenthetical thought. It's just a, it's like, wait a minute, when I think of all of the stuff that I just told you about, but wait a minute, I got to tell you just a little bit more. I just want to tell you why and, and how this all came about because this is so good. And, and, and so he starts out, when I think of all of this, and then he tells us a little bit more, and we're going to learn about that. And then he gets down to verse 14, and, and he says, when I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father. Do you sense the climax? When I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father. All week long, as I've been thinking about these verses, I've been trying to figure out how we, you and I, might be moved to fall to our knees before the Father. Upon hearing all that we've heard, are we moved to fall to our knees before the Father? Let's just review a little bit briefly. We talked about the first week, this is in chapter one, that God has a plan and it includes you. His plan is not just for you individually, it's not just for your individual salvation, but his plan is for all of his creation, to redeem all of his creation. And the beautiful thing of that is that it includes you. There is this grand plan and it includes you and it was a mysterious plan he says in chapter one and he repeats that now in chapter three it's this mystery but here's the plan and it includes you that was chapter one and then at the end of chapter one you'll note that he goes into a prayer it's kind of like okay here's the plan and now i'm going to pray that you would recognize 
that plan, that you would be filled with some spiritual wisdom, that you would be filled with an ability to understand God's power to accomplish his will. So that was chapter one. God has a plan. You're part of it. I pray that you understand it. I pray that your eyes will be open and you'll see that. Then we moved into chapter two and it says, we are his beautiful works of art with a purpose. That's you and me and his church. We are his masterpieces in progress. Now that's not just to get out of earth and get to heaven. That's not what this is all about. This is not just like save me from this life, God, and take me to be with you. No, we are masterpieces in progress, works of art for this time, for this place, for his created purpose to redeem his purpose, to be his agents in this world. We are reigning on his behalf, doing good works that he intended for us to do all along from before time began. We are his beautiful works of art with a purpose. And then we talked a little bit last week about Jesus Christ being that reconciling person and how he came to break down the dividing walls of hostility. He came to be a unifying force. He will bring unity to all things on heaven and on earth. No longer divided. We are no longer separated. We are one in Christ Jesus. That's, where we've, that's how we've gotten to this point. So we come through this process and we get to chapter 3 and he's, now, and he's like, now when I think of all of this, You've been made with, alive with God's power in you, and we all have access to the same Holy Spirit to be a united people for his purposes. For this reason, and oh, wait a minute, I just need to tell you a little bit more to make my point. That's where we are. I, Paul, just notice in verse 1 of chapter 3, it says, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Let's stop right there. I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. He's sitting potentially in Rome. He's sitting in chains. Most of us would think that you were a prisoner of the state, but Paul says, no, I'm not a prisoner of the state. I am here because of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus allowed me to be here, and I am celebrating that today. Every trial, every injustice done to Paul was seen by him in light of serving the gospel. He wasn't mad. He wasn't upset. He wasn't even lamenting, and he wasn't writing for their pity. He just wanted them to know, this gospel I've been preaching for you Gentiles, it's worth it to be in the chains, because what I am telling you is the truth. His sense, his excitement, what I'm telling you is the truth. How do we convince the world that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? By being willing to suffer for it. By being so filled with passion that no matter what happens to me, I declare, no matter what the world does to me, I am going to tell the truth of Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is what he is saying. It doesn't matter what the state does to me. It doesn't matter where I am. I am telling you the truth that this mystery has come to fruition. I resolve to carry forth the message of Jesus Christ. Acts 21, verse 28 says, When I think of all of this, I have no problem with my present situations. How many of you can say that this morning? When I think of all of this, I have no problem with my present situations. Consider that as we continue this morning. Paul is writing in chains. When I think of all of this, it doesn't matter. Acts 21, 28 says why he's in chains. It says, this is the man who preaches against our people everywhere and tells everybody to disobey the Jewish laws. He speaks against the temple and even defiles this holy place by bringing in Gentiles. Now, in his letter, this letter to the Ephesians, he says plainly, yes, that that is why I'm in chains. It's all for you, Gentiles. And here today with your own ears, it's all for me. That's us. That's us. It's all for you and for me. And it's certainly for my Jewish friends, but only the ones that believe that Christ is making all things new. As he says in his letter to the Galatians, there is now no Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free. We are all one in Christ Jesus. 
And if you come back to our letter to the Ephesians in verse 20 of chapter 2, he says this. He's just finished saying this. Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. Can I get an amen? Amen. He's talking about the unity and the experience and his calling and his purpose. He says, for this reason, I sit in prison. I sit in prison because I believe this message. And then he says, oh, just let me remind you. Can I just take a few minutes and remind you a little bit of how I got here? For this reason. But let me just take a minute and tell you how I got here. And then he launches in with verse 2 and following. He says, because God revealed the mystery of it to me, and he compelled me to tell everyone about it. A mystery was revealed. A mystery. If you read my midweek uh, message in the, in the MailChimp, in the midweek email that comes out, I told you a little bit about the word mystery. The word mystery does not necessarily mean like we think of it, something that's hidden and secretive and, and can't be known. But in the Greek, the word mysterion actually is a word that relates to something that has been revealed. And so when it talks about this idea of a mystery having been revealed, this is what Paul's talking about. It's no longer hidden. It's not secret. We don't have to live in fear that somehow God's trying to do something that we don't know about. It's not it at all. This mystery has now been revealed. Let's go back to Acts, uh, and then the mystery must be proclaimed. The, the Acts, verse 20, or chapter 26, verse 15, Paul is on his way. He's, he's on trial here, and he's standing before Agrippa. And I just want you to hear a little bit about the mystery that was revealed to him. He's giving testimony now to King Agrippa. I'm in Acts 26, and I'm starting with verse 15. And he's relaying this story to King Agrippa. He says this. I'll pick it up where Jesus is talking to him. He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. The Lord replied, now get up and stand on your feet. This is a retelling of his Acts chapter 9 conversion account. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Paul had been given a mandate through revelation to bring the Gentiles into the fold into the fold. The Jews of the time just couldn't quite comprehend it, and they decided to put him in prison for it. That's why Paul's sitting in prison, writing this letter in chains, because he believed with all of his heart that he had been given a, the revelation of the mystery revealed before time began to tell the Gentiles that they were a part of everything that would follow. We... we know that there was allusions to it. The Jews, it's not like they couldn't have seen it, right? We, we know all the way back to Abram, the calling of the people. Like Abram, God told him and said, I'm going to make you a great nation and you will be a blessing to all the other nations. We hear in that the hint of God's plan for all of humanity. We, so right from the very beginning, we could have learned it. The, the prophets repeated it. We read it in Zechariah, for instance. This is just one instance. Zechariah chapter 8, says, uh, verse 13 says this. It will come about that just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so I will save you that you might become a blessing. Do not fear. Let your hands be strong. The original covenant, the prophets, there is all this kind of testimony that was leading up to this idea that the Gentiles were actually going to be a part of this bigger picture. And Paul goes on to explain what is, what was, what was that mystery? If you come back to Ephesians and you're in chapter 3 again and, and you look at verse 6, Paul doesn't make us wonder what was the mystery. In verse 6 he spells it out very clearly. He completes his thought. The Gentiles have become fellow heirs, 
members of the same body, and sharers in the promise. Now, it's interesting, if you were reading this in the Greek, you would find that those are three Greek words that Paul actually has put together with the prefix su, su, and that prefix actually means together, like a partnership kind of thing. And in fact, the, the middle word that he used wasn't even a word before he created it. He's so excited, he, he comes up and he makes his own word, and it says, the members of one body. That is like his own word. But it's a play on the word with the prefix. We're all together now. We're all partners in this. Jews and Gentiles. This is why I am in chains for you. So we have a divine mystery that God really intended to save the whole world. You can go all the way back to Genesis 1. He created this world with humanity in mind to be stewards of his creation and to live this whole thing out with him in partnership. It's a beautiful picture. And then things went wrong and sin entered the game and now he has to reclaim his people and he does that through a people, the Jews, but it was never meant for them alone. It was meant for all of us. And then he sent his son to make that clear. And now, Paul, I've revealed this divine mystery. Now that mystery, that message must be proclaimed. Notice in, vol in verse 8, if you're following along in your scriptures there, Paul says, I wasn't qualified. Full stop. Full stop. I wasn't qualified. I want you to be careful that you don't read that. Like in our culture, and a lot of times we can actually put up false humility. Like I'm not ready. I don't think. I'm not sure. I don't feel calm. Whatever. That's not what Paul's saying here. This is not false humility. He was the best trained Pharisee that was out there. And he makes that claim in other parts of his scripture, which made him in many ways the worst of all sinners. He's not being falsely humble. He was a persecutor of Christians. When he says, I wasn't qualified, I am the least of all people, he is telling you from the bottom of his heart, he knows he doesn't deserve to be telling this message. Another full stop. The good news of Jesus Christ will be proclaimed regardless of any of us. The good news of Jesus doesn't require qualifications. You hear that? The good news of Jesus doesn't require qualifications. I was just doing a little reading last night on some of the history of our church and some of the great reformers and some of the great preachers and some of the great revivals were started by people who were rather uneducated. It's kind of incredible to see how God uses people who are just willing who recognize, who see what Paul is trying to get us all to see in these verses here. Surrender, willingness, belief. The mystery has been revealed. The mystery must be proclaimed. He goes on in verse 8 to say this, the message of the endless, or in some translations you'll read, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Do you sense the climax here? Are you getting this? Because I'm not seeing it in your faces yet, all right? Do you get the climax that's building here? The unsearchable riches of Christ. He's saying this, the, there was a mystery. It's now been revealed, and I just can't wait to tell you all about it. I can't wait. And oh, I can't really tell you all about it because Jesus Christ is just too good. He's just too good. There's so much to tell. Can you just think with me for a minute? of all your needs, of your wants, of all your desires, and then lay them at the feet of a limitless, loving God who wants each of us to be connected to him, and he made that way possible. Amen? I'm telling you this is good stuff. I want you this morning to tune in. God in all of creation from the beginning of time had this plan 
in mind. He is for all people everywhere, and everyone needs to hear about it. The mystery has been revealed. The mystery must be proclaimed. Why? Why? Paul is moving on here. Are you getting the feel of his excitement? I hope you are. Are you getting the feel? Why? Because the church. That's what he says. Because of the church. That's you and me now. Like, why has all of this come and, and why are we here now? Because of the church. Remember, he's writing to the Ephesians. This is a fledgling church, and he's trying to encourage them. This isn't just about you personally. This is about the church. If any of you have ever had questions about why church, why do I come, why do we do this, why do we gather, why? all of those questions, they are answered right here in Ephesians chapter 3. Why? Because the church. This is the new thing that God is doing bringing all people together. The church is the testimony. Get this. Look in verse 10. I was really stuck on verse 10 this week. This is the message to the angels and the demons, to all the authorities, the principalities in the heavenly realms. The church is the witness to all of them. In other words, they didn't know from the beginning of time. They didn't know this mystery. This is a mystery that was revealed to Paul to us as individuals, through the church, the testimony now goes to the angels and to the demons. They're learning about God's plan through us. I don't know if you got that. I don't know. They, the heavenly realms are learning about God's plan through you and me. That is powerful. That is big time. The church the church, one of the translations says, the church exists to display the manifold wisdom. I want you to stop right there on that word manifold. Let me just explain that word because it's a beautiful word. It means many-sided or many-colored. If you were to go back and read the Old Testament in the Greek translation, that same word would have been used, was used, to explain Joseph's coat of many colors. Many, many colors. We are meant to get this idea of a rich and colorful diversity. The church is God's manifold wisdom, the rich diversity of all the peoples on the earth coming together to declare to the angels and the demons that God's plan for redemption is being fulfilled through us. Do you get it? Are you excited? That's what Paul's trying to convince the Ephesians. Like, this is good news. It only means anything because of Jesus Christ. He is the hinge point of history. He is the reason the church is now possible. He is the hope and the glory of God. And he goes on in verse 11. He says, there now is no impediment to our access to God. Because of Christ, we are free to approach him. Amen? The church is the mystery revealed since the beginning of time. And he says in verse 13, he says that, therefore, don't lose heart because of my trials and my suffering. Don't worry about me. And here we need to be reminded of our own sufferings and our trials for Jesus Christ. They are all part of God's plan to display God's glory to all the nations and into the heavenly realms. Do you get it? Do you get the good news of the church? The climax, he's saying, Ephesians, you are special people. New hope, you are special people. You are fulfilling my vision, my plan since the beginning of time. This church, you are my witness to the heavenly realms. You are my witness to the world to bring redemption to all people. Yes, my son has made the way. He is the access point, but it is now through you, the church. Verse 14, for this reason... Just like he started out. For this reason, when I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father. Does it move you to fall to your knees 
and pray to the Father. Church, we need to come alive. Church, we have a glorious mission. We need to be telling others this good news. Church, we can only get where we need to be through prayer. When I fall to my knees, I pray to the Father. We need to pray, we need to tell others, and we need to live into God's power. You and I, we will never choose prison or pain. Raise your hand if you would ever choose prison or pain. You will never choose prison or pain except that through prayer we are empowered to live into moments of persecution. Amen? Church, you will never tell others of this good news except that we are empowered and we believe it with all of our hearts. How will anyone ever know except that they be told? We must tell, but we must also experience. This cannot come about without an infilling and power from the, only, the Holy Spirit that only comes through prayer. With Paul, I, wanna, I want us all to fall to our knees. Not because I'm telling you. I'm not telling you to fall to your knees. I'm just, I want that to be the overflow and the expression from our hearts. When we sense the gravity of this good news, when we sense the need and the opportunity that we have to go and tell others, our calling and our mandate as the church to declare the manifold wisdom of God to the heavenly realms, to declare the potential for doing good works because we are being shaped and molded into the works of art he intended us to be. Do I need to say that again? Let me say it one more time. Our calling and our mandate as the church to declare the manifold wisdom of God in the heavenly realms, to declare the potential for doing good works because we are being shaped and molded into the works he intended us to be. This is Paul's message to the Ephesians and to us. We are the church. I think I need an amen out of that one. We are the church. We are God's plan for the world. You can be part of that plan. Christ has made the way. We are in it together. Amen? Amen. There is a tension that exists in our churches. There is a tension that exists when we try to live out being the church. Some of us believe that church is all about personal salvation. Some of us believe that we come to church just to see the forgiveness of our sins. And yes, that is a big reason why we come to church. But many of us put that against the need for our churches to be engaged in some kind of social action and social movements and justice-oriented things, and we create this tension. What does church exist for? When it says we are the church and he is writing to encourage us to be the church, it is not just about one or the other. I'm telling you, it is about both. And so we need to be vocal about things that are going on in the world around us. We need to be vocal about the injustices that exist in the world. Why do we exist as the church if we are not investing in the things that are happening out there in the world? You don't come here every Sunday just to be empowered, just to go back and have a great prayer life with God. Like, yes, that is a big part of it. We are to fall to our knees in prayer, but unto what? To go out and tell the world the hope of Jesus Christ, to bring restoration, to bring redemption to the world that is all around us. It is not a tension. And in too many of our churches, we've made it out to be that. We've made it out like it's all for one and all, or all for the other, and we align ourselves with certain churches based upon where we believe we fit in that. But it is both and. The call to the mission, the be the mission of the church, is about personal salvation and justice in the world. And if we, the church, are not speaking against injustice, we are not being the church in its fullness. We are not expressing the manifold wisdom of God and Declaring that our beautiful diversity is meant for something more than just personal salvation. God wants your life. 
to be in relationship with him. And if you are not there today, if you have not given your life over to God, if there is not a cleansing of your life every week, every day, every hour from sin, then that needs to be your step. That's your next step. Declare to God that you need to be forgiven. And I, as your pastor, when I stand up here, I cannot be afraid to tell you that you have sin in your life. I cannot be afraid to tell you that you are not living fully for Jesus Christ. And sometimes I am. You know why I am? Because sometimes it just seems like in our world and in our culture that we are just a little bit afraid to talk about sin. That we are afraid to go there. We are afraid to have personal salvation be something that we seek after because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But I can't stand up here and tell you not to be seeking after God's heart and being forgiven week after week and Sunday after Sunday, day after day in your own personal life. You need God's forgiveness. And some of you need it a lot today. Some of you are crying out and wondering where God is in the midst of all of that. God is there for you today. God is there for you today, and he wants you to confront the sin in your life. Take some time to examine your heart. Where is there sin in your life? In thought, in attitude, or in deed? Where is there sin in your life? Because that's not what God intends. He requires and wants holiness. But even as I tell you that you need forgiveness of your sins, I'm telling you that it doesn't stop there. That we are required to speak against injustice in the world. That we are required to take that renewed life, that redeemed life that's in us, and that corporate life that we share, and we are called to go out into the world and tell the world that it's supposed to be different, that God didn't design it to be the way it is today. The fallenness, the brokenness, the hurt, and the pain, and all the stuff that exists out there. We are called to speak into those things. The racism and the injustice, and the political differences, and the divides, and all of that stuff that exists out there. The church is meant to be something different, a different way, a unified. Jesus Christ came to unify us. He came to break down those dividing walls of hostility. He came to bring healing and hope and redemption for the brokenness that exists in the world, the relationships that are being torn apart. He came to change all of that. And so I tell you, On the one hand, this is personal, and on the other hand, it's corporate. And if I begin to speak in ways that offend you because we are speaking against injustice, I apologize now. But I cannot stand any longer and not speak against the injustices in the world. And for too long, I've tried to walk that because we are a diverse church. And because I I don't want to offend one person or the other, I don't want to stand on one side of the political divide or the I don't want you to think that I'm coming, becoming partisan. I'm not. But there is injustice that exists in the world, and you will hear me begin to speak more forcefully against it. Because that is who we are called to be as the church, and I don't, I desperately don't want to offend any of you. But I am called first to speak the truth of Jesus Christ. And if that offends your ears, please come and talk to me because I am not trying to push anybody away. But we must be more honest about sin in our lives. And we must be more honest about injustice in the world. And both of those things must embody who we are as the church. We are the church, and if you haven't sensed the gravity of that, by the end of this message, listen to this prayer, and I invite you to just put your hands up, get to your knees, whatever you feel like doing this morning, I am going to pray the prayer that Paul prayed after he heard, after he said these verses. This is the prayer. It says, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. 
I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We are going to take a few minutes and give you a chance to respond. We have said that this offering today, whatever is given, all of this offering is going to support a project that will help individuals who are being exploited, are being hurt, and give them a sustainable future for up to 100 years. Your giving today will be going 100% to support that. So there's offering baskets up here, but there's prayer cards. You know you got the bulletins as you came in. What is God saying to you? And just take some time to respond to him because church, there's more for us to do. And this day, may it be marked in our history as a day, a turning point of who we are really called to be. Amen.